there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for typologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for typologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on typology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephology Podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephologists. Tephal Cultures. Okay, so for today's Tephal Culture, I'd like to talk about contrastive analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in Scott Formbury's blog, um, An A to Z of ELT, this is one of the C's. I think there might be more than one. I think he's, start, he's gone back over the alphabet and yeah. trying to add more letters. Yeah. Well, not trying to add more letters, but add to the letters. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the C's. And um, according to Scott Formbury, contrastive analysis was brought about at the conjunction of both a descriptive and functional perspective to language. Right. With con contrastive analysis, rather than expelling L1 uses the ability to confront differences to form a basis of language course design and teaching practice. Okay. So that, does that mean basically using the L1? Yeah. To, right. But, but looking at the differences between the L1 and the L2. Yep. Right, right. But I think the original aims of contrastive analysis weren't applied to language learning. Mm -hmm. It was just more as a way to kind of learn more about language by right. comparing two languages. But it, it, in the past, it has been applied to... Mm -hmm. The classroom, obviously, like mm -hmm. any kind of linguistic thing yeah, is right. at some point. Um, contrastive analysis came about from the linguistic circle of Prague, mm -hmm. or the Prague School, as it's most commonly known, um, around the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, do you know the founder of the Prague School? Not personally, but do you know of <laughs> No. No. A guy called Wilhelm Mathesius. Okay. okay. Have you come across him before? I think I've heard the name, but I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about him. <laughs> Great. <laughs> he, he was one of the founders, and amongst other uh, approaches that he had, he, he used a functional sentence perspective to grammar. Okay. Uh, meaning the information conveyed by utterances. Right. Like, the, yeah, the utterance conveys information. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Functional grammar. Yep. Um, one of the starting points for contrastive analysis was on showing how in different languages a functional sentence perspective interacts with other systems. Uh, one example he made, according to an article by New Mayer, was on syntax mm -hmm. as, a, as a separate system. And he talked about in Czech, um, the Czech language has a relatively free word order mm -hmm. with the thematic element mm -hmm which I had to kind of find out what this meant. Um, it's the content known to the addressee. Yep. Okay. Placed prominently in the, in the sentence structure. Mm -hmm. However, in English, it requires a subject, verb, object order, so it's more restrictive. Yep. So okay. this, on a very crude level, <laughs> on a very crude level, this is a contrastive analysis right. being done. And he was one of the first to kind of, kind of use this method mm -hmm. okay. as part of the Prague School. Um, contrastive analysis also ties in with behaviorist theories mm -hmm. as well. For example, habit formation. And a lot of people at the time believed that knowledge, L1 knowledge impedes L2 acquisition. Mm. And they, at the time, I think they thought that this was one of the main reasons why for not being able to learn the language. So <clears throat> contrastive analysis influenced behaviorism or contrastive analysis went against behaviorism do you mean i mean it was i, th I believe it was part of a behaviorist approach okay so it was mm. used a lot or behaviorists believe they put a lot of emphasis on a, a student's l1 uh, so it was, it believed was, that those habits that they had from their l1 affected or impeded their l2 so it was it was used to justify behaviorism in that sense. Yeah, okay, possibly. Yeah. Right, yeah. I see. And they use words like interference a lot, mm. which we still use today, but I think we kind of use it in uh, not such a strong way, right. perhaps. Yeah. 
Um, in the classroom, the use or understanding of a learner's L1 may allow teachers to predict the difficulties involved in acquiring a second language. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something Jack Richard states back in the in the 70s, I believe, in the paper I found. Um, those elements that are similar to the learner's native language will be simple, and those areas that are different will be difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, makes this sense. Is, this yeah. makes sense. And it, these were claims also echoed by Robert Lado. Mm-hmm who was another supporter of this approach. And I think he wrote a book in the early 50s, mm. which was one of the kind of main resources for contrastive analysis. Right. Mm. Um, yet contrastive analysis over time has fallen out of favour, um, and even as far back as the 1970s, it's come under criticism. Mm. For example, Ronald Wardo stated that a strong version of contrastive analysis demands linguists and teachers to have complete descriptions of two languages at hand before the correct set of contrast can be produced. This probably wouldn't work for most backpacker teachers then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think this is one of the reasons why um, English language teaching is has come to be known as, or people think of it as coming to be known as such an easy um, profession to take because obviously modern communicative language teaching mm. doesn't require much knowledge of the L1. Yeah, well, and that's that's kind of one ah, of the reasons why yeah. contrastive analysis has fallen out of favour because a right. strong CRT mm. kind of got rid of all of that. Yeah, mm. as what Michael Swan said, he t- <clears throat> in his papers criticising the communicative approach, he talks a little about contrastive analysis. Yeah, and yeah. he says, you know, it, it it's really annoying to see these things being suddenly declared as useless mm. yeah. when, for me as a teacher, they were very useful. And then he also says it's very convenient that. As a profession, we've decided that the uh, the best methods are the ones that don't require us to learn any foreign languages. <laughs> right, right, right. But I, I mean, also the way that I learned a lot about English grammar, I didn't the the way I I didn't learn English grammar at school. Mm. Maybe like you, a lot you were of, learning Latin, weren't you? I was learning Latin, yeah. um, and we we had a you know I had a GCSE in English language literature, but there was very little in terms of well, there was nothing in terms of the actual grammar mm. of English. But I learned about English grammar through studying French, right. Latin, and yeah, German. Yeah. And it was only by studying those things that I became aware of all these things in English. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, personally, I think it has a place in the language <coughs> classroom. And I think it has come back into favour quite recently as well, which I'll mm. talk about. Um, one of the reasons why people stopped kind of using the approach is because it's very hard to collect empirical evidence mm. um, of complete kind of um, sets of contrasts. Right. And there are also claims by the contrast of analysis hypothesis that complete contrasts of two languages alone answer why interference takes place. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, this is not true anymore, basically. People, they couldn't collect enough evidence to support why this was the case. Mm. Right. Um, so contrasting alone cannot predict for all, langu- all language learning difficulties. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Alone, there's so many other factors that come into play. Uh, okay. Can you think of what those factors might be? Um, just being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> just languages being very complex systems that are hard to get your head around. Yeah, I mean, um, cultural yeah. differences. Uh huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. In terms, like, you, could, you could. I wonder if you could fold that into some kind of contrastive analysis. Uh, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Depends how much you tie language to culture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, there's, there was another article I read by Alp Tekin um, that talked about um, the use of contrastive analysis and bringing in target cultures mm. as well, yeah, and right. language and how culture is tied to language and vice versa, and mm-hmm. how you could contrast the two that way. But um, yeah. uh, it seems in the last three decades or so, um, particularly from the mid 1980s, that strong versions of CRT have sight of sidelined applications of contrastive analysis right um, particularly learning through the target language which mm. is obviously part of the strong form mm-hmm. however mm. more recently in the last i think 15 years or so um there's a feeling that we are now returning once again to looking at the role and impact that a learner's l1 could play on second language acquisition um regarding for example regarding the area of vocabulary and in Inclusion of the learners L1 may have a crucial and altogether pivotal part to play. Okay. And this is this is actually from a paper that I wrote last year, around this time last year. <laughs> okay. So, um, but I edited it slightly. Um, this is supported by Batia Laufer's work, who we've mm-hmm. interviewed before, um, where she argues that learners unconsciously translate anyway. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And she points to research. Sorry, that shows un- unconsciously. Unconsciously. Mm. Why? 
What, what's weird about that? Uh, oh. Mm. But I mean, do you think some people translate consciously? Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and some people translate unconsciously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that what it said? <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, I'm not sure what she means. She, I guess she means that learners are, they're making the translations anyway as they speak English. Yeah, maybe well, maybe she's, she's maybe saying you <coughs> can't help but make the translations. Yeah, yeah. It's not right, like you're, right. you're making an effort to do it, just your brain does it. Yeah, yeah. And she points to research to show that L1 glosses are beneficial mm-hmm. in terms of vocabulary acquisition. Mm-hmm. And Guy Cook is also another um, uh, academic who is strongly in favour of using the L1 in the classroom. Yeah, he wrote the book Translation uh, right, in the language right. classroom, right? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. He believes that L2 learners of English are multi-competent language users with the ability to make L1 and L2 coexist collaboratively. Mm. So he thinks that the interplay between the two <clears throat> to, to be better than just using the L2. Right. Basically, there's no getting away from L1 use, I guess, mm. in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know if this applies to classes where not everybody shares the same L1. Right. I was wondering that at the beginning. Yeah. Well, not because these kind of things are very vague. And I'm, yeah. I'm wondering. I'm not, yeah. yeah. I mean, as, as you mentioned, obviously individual students are doing it themselves. Right, right. With their own right, L1. Right. Um, yeah. but it's not always going to be possible with their classmates. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, it, it seemed to contradict the point about behaviorism before, mm. what you just said. Mm. That you, you were saying earlier that behaviorism, contrast analysis, was used to justify behaviorism, but what you just said seemed to kind of... No, I don't, I don't think trust analysis was used to justify. I think it was a part of right. a behaviorist approach. Hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think contrastive techniques were used within that mm. kind of paradigm. But behaviorism was all about yeah. habit formation, right? Yeah, so okay. I, I took you to mean okay. that... that the you're you're learning new habits to override the old habits. Right, right, right. Mm. Yeah, so but I'm not. Sure. But they were I saying. I can't imagine behavior. I don't know, but I can't imagine behaviorism would say that you want to override your L one habits. Well, not override. No, but they, like, they were saying that <laughs> break, the, break them. <laughs> those habits are predicated by their L one. Right. Okay. Mm. So you have to take the take the L one habits into account when you yeah. try to make yeah. these new habits. Okay. Yeah, and I think yeah. they attributed all mistakes to their L one. Okay. At the time, right, right. but not anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, not anymore. Yeah. Because yep. um, what they're doing now, and it's coming back into favor, and the new contrastive analysis hypothesizes that the more different the L two is with one's L one, the easier it is for one to learn the target language. Mm-hmm. So the more different, the better. Right. Uh, I guess because you'll be tricked by subtler changes, subtler differences or something? The premise is that similarities in language create confusion for learners. So I guess it, it's kind What's of like when you, when you present a load of connected words to students like, that are on the same topic, they'll mix them up. But if you show them all words that are all different topics, then they won't mix them up as much. Mm. Right, but sim- similarities can cause confusion, but they uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they also they also make things a lot easier. Like it's not it's not that they just cause confusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, this was actually this last part was found on when I typed this into Wikipedia. Right. Okay. That's from Wikipedia, but I'm not sure I fully agree with that. Mm-hmm. I think it's far more, um, like far more of a dynamic problem than just saying that simply. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. I. I I don't know. I mean, from anecdotal personal experience, I'd mm. say that languages that are closer to your own are le- easier to learn. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd have thought so. Mm. Especially, think, especially if there's yeah. a lot of shared vocabulary and phonemes and all that kind of stuff. I think it might simply come down to the, <clears throat> the two languages mm. juxtaposed with each other. Right. I, mm-hmm. I, can't, I think, like, contrastive analysis can't answer all languages. Mm. Or it can't dispel all languages either. Yeah, I think it depends on the language. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. All the languages. So was the grammar translation was a, a form of contrastive analysis, do you think? I, I guess it would have been. Like, yeah. um, you're, you're looking at the different aspects of the text and you're, you know... But, but then you're not, you're not trying to... I don't know. You're not comparing, you're just simply yeah. translating. It's probably like everything else in the LT methodology. Like, it's all sort of connected at yeah, certain yeah. levels. So I think it would be hard to translate something from one language to the other without yeah. making those those contrasts. But then we, we talked about, um, with uh, mm-hmm. the Yakudoku method, mm-hmm. 
when you actually follow through the way that they right, did the right. translations, they just did a literal translation and produced a literal, trans- a literal translation and then reordered everything once they'd got it. So it was kind of like a form of proofreading once they had all the words and stuff. So that wasn't really... Just like word-to-word word translations? It, it, well, word and... Yeah, like we, we, we did an example. I can't remember what it was now, but um, what came out at the end was like this very unnatural Japanese sentence from yeah. the English sentence. Um, and then you'd, you'd then just... You know, rejig ah, that right, right, to make right. it you, more you get the meaning of it. Yeah, right? yeah I exactly. guess if you then if you did a translation, then did a form focused kind of analysis, mm. that would be contrastive. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. right. So that's contrastive analysis. What What do you think of it? <laughs> it's probably <laughs> it's probably quite useful. I think. Like, it, I think yeah. there's certainly a place for that kind of thing. I share the same concern that you had about multilingual classes, like yeah. how you would use it in multilingual classes. But I guess if it's going on within the head of the learners <laughs> anyway, then that's that's kind of fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you'd have to have, you'd either have to have a very strong metalinguistic awareness of English, <clears throat> or you'd have to do a lot of planning in advance if you yeah. want to use it as yeah. the basis for a class. Yeah, I wonder if some like some kind of strategy training. If it could be in part of strategy mm. training, because again, my experience of learning languages, it, often it was you know learning a grammar rule and then just deciding okay that's the same as English or that's different from English right right and that's kind of a, that's a you know a compartment that you put it into each grammar yeah. rule you say, oh, okay I can, I can, mm, mm. that's easy because that's the same or that's easy because I just remember that it's different you know? right right um, and I'm sure lots of learners do that naturally but <clears throat> it might it might be, I don't know it might be useful for some learners to be trained to do that kind of thing yeah if we go back to um, Wilhelm Mathesius mm. uh-huh. Just the point, like, just taking the function, the, what, what does this, what's mm. the function of this utterance? Yeah. yeah. And comparing, comparing two languages that way in terms of what does this utterance achieve mm. yeah. is quite important, quite useful, I think. Like, that, but that almost feels less, I mean, it's still contrastive, but it feels less about looking at the kind of the nuts and bolts of the grammar mm. and more like do this to, to, well, to the perform prag- this pragmatic, The pragmatic yeah. kind of element of... Yeah, it's more like comparative analysis <laughs> than contrastive analysis. <laughs> right, that's right. Right. Yeah. TEFL news. Today's TEFL news is uh, it's it's actually not quite news. It occurred last year, um, but it's a debate in the Journal of Second Language Writing, um, initiated by Ken Highland. Did you hear about this at all? No. Oh, maybe yes. Okay. <laughs> do, do you remember Did anything I? about it? No. Well, um, so this was a series of articles. Uh, mm-hmm. The original one was published um, early in 2016 by Ken Highland. It was called Academic Publishing and the Myth of Linguistic Injustice. Mm-hmm. Um, it was followed up by a response from a group of authors to which Highland wrote his own response. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'll do is go through and summarise the three articles, and after each one we can discuss what we think about mm-hmm. each of the points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, Highland opens the first article... Uh, by noting that academic publishing is increasingly important for scholars. It's a way of uh, measuring a researcher's worth uh, and improving career opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, He also says that increases in submissions of articles from countries... uh, So he calls them the BRIC countries, which is um, Brazil, Russia, India, India, I think, and China. Okay. Um, Sorry, no, Iran and China, that's right. Um, Have all increased uh, by hundreds of percent. So, particularly, he says Iran and Malaysia have increased the number of submissions in the last couple of decades by 800 percent. How come? How come? Well, because they have to, because that's how. uh, you know, that's how you, you move up in the academic ladder these days. Oh, yeah. um, it's, it's increased by hundreds of percent in the US and the UK and so mm. on as well, mm. but mm. more so in these, in these right, other countries. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so even though the number of submissions has increased greatly, the ratio of uh, acceptances has not increased that much. So okay. the, number, the number of submissions from these BRIC countries... Um, has increased by hundreds and hundreds of percent, uh-huh. um, but the number of acceptances has not changed particularly. Okay. So the acceptance rate has gone down? It's it stayed about the same. Oh, oh yes, yeah, the rate has gone yeah. down, yes, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, and so there are many authors from these regions who feel that editors and reviewers are biased against them mm. due to non-standard English use. Mm-hmm. Um, And they also believe that L1 users uh, are seen to have an advantage because they didn't have to invest the same amount of time, effort Mm -hmm. and money into learning a foreign language as they did. Hmm. So in other words, there's this view that for second language writers in academic publishing, there is a linguistic injustice. 
Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the opening. Mm. Um, Highland then summarizes some of the past research. So he says, again, submission rates have increased, but acceptance rates have not. Um, papers from EAL authors often have to kind of conform to certain writing conventions. They often don't quite meet those conventions because of slightly different, you know, mm-hmm. um, norms in their countries. Mm-hmm. Um, he says, he, he, he summarized a lot of studies that show that uh, English as an additional language writers often perceive themselves to be disadvantaged, so they self-report okay. feeling disadvantaged. Um, but that's not completely uniform, so some researchers don't feel disadvantaged. Um, and Highland kind of summarizes that by saying that attitudes towards whether they're disadvantaged or not seem to be uh, influenced by their language proficiency, their first language, the discipline they're working in, mm-hmm. and their amount of publishing experience. Okay. So he says that there's no clear picture about the role that language plays in the unbalanced acceptance rate, um, and most evidence suggesting that there is a linguistic injustice, uh, injustice is based on self-report studies. Okay. Okay. So that's his, his summary of the past research. Um, he then talks about two problematic assumptions uh, in this idea of linguistic injustice. Mm-hmm. The first one is the native-non-native divide. Mm-hmm. So he kind of rehearses the, the, the general points about this being a problematic distinction, which we've mm-hmm. talked about on the podcast before, so I won't go over them again. Um, and he, he then moves on to his main point, which is that academic writing is a particular register. Mm-hmm. And he says that academic English is nobody's first language. Mm. Um, uh, he reviews quite a lot of literature showing that the main issue for second language writers is experience and familiarity with conventions and not their L1. Okay? okay. So that's the first problematic assumption. The native-non-native divide is, is questionable, and it doesn't really apply to academic writing anyway because everyone has to learn how to write academically. Okay. Okay. Um, the next point that he brings up is situatedness and isolation. Mm-hmm. So he says that scholars in non-centre nations uh, often have little access to literature, to funds to the colleagues that maybe they did their postgraduate work with and, and so on. Um, they may not be able to keep up with the research in their area because their institutions don't have very good access. They may not have the funds to conduct experiments and, and so on. Um, and so he, he sums it up by saying, the disadvantages of physical, scholarly and financial isolation may be greater than those of language. Mm-hmm. A crude native, non-native dichotomy fails to capture a far more complex picture. Okay. okay, so that's the second point that there are other reasons mm. why uh, people may fail to get accepted in mm. journals. Uh, he next talks about gatekeeping and discusses whether there is any gatekeeping bias mm-hmm. in journals. Um, he finds very little evidence based on the, the research that currently exists. Mm-hmm. So he uh, cites some studies which looked at reviewer comments and editor comments and says the comments rarely reject. Uh, se- papers written by second language writers um, on the basis of their language, it's always on the ba- or it's very often or mostly on the basis of the content right. or the design of the studies. Okay. Okay. So he concludes his paper by saying linguistic injustice is a myth. Um, he says it's a damaging myth mm-hmm. which discourage, uh, discourages second language authors uh, and tells them to look for prejudice rather than working to improve their work or okay. revising their work. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says it minimises the challenges faced by L1 English writers by saying, you know, they have this advantage mm-hmm. beforehand. So that's that's a, a quick summary of his uh, his first article. Yeah. What do you think of that argument? Yeah, well, I was going to say, like, any, any rejections based on, like, improper language, mm. they can easily be tidied up. Right. So I don't think they'd reject something based on... You know, if if it wasn't in the correct like register, mm. yeah, whatever the correct register is. Yeah, he he mm. also says actually that many of the reviewers and editors put a lot of effort into advising people on how to improve their writing and adhere to the conventions of journals and things. Mm. Mm. Another question I had is, if it's blind peer reviewed, then surely they wouldn't know where the the person submitting would be coming from. Uh, no. I guess it's implied within the study. The, the editors would know that, yeah, and I guess, it, as you say, it's implied in the study. Maybe mm. it, the language choices might reveal something as well. Because as mm. far as I know, there's no quota of who they should accept from where. No, no, no. So that doesn't come into it. No. Right. Yeah. 
So are you are you overall convinced by his argument that that, that linguistic injustice is a myth? Ano- I mean, it, well, another th- thing, going back to the actual content, you said that they refuse um, submissions based on content. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I see that as being true, because mm-hmm. like I've said before, I, I think. May again, I don't want to use this term native and non-native, but I think we do have like I say, parallel research interests. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe certain writers are writing under one kind of non-kind of popular paradigm. Right. Does that make sense? I see what you mean, mm. but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, yeah. Like, I think there are, certain, there are certain kinds of studies that don't get accepted, but I don't, I don't think that native and non-native, if we're going to use those, I don't think... Like, because it's not like like all of the all of the people in the world fit into these two camps with no other no, things. No. Like, people in different countries will have different interests, and people in different yeah. mm. subdisciplines. Well, then, will have but then it comes back to the point that raised earlier about you know how much culture is part of language, right? Because mm. the 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 reviewers may not be dismissing things on purely you know what we think of more linguistic grounds. Mm. But there may be a culture, cultural aspect to it, right? Which you, which you could argue is maybe linguistic in nature. Yeah. So they, I think they, they, it, I can't remember which article it was. If it was in this article or the responses, but it said that um, people may reject uh, articles that have poor English on the on the assumption that they think that that that's almost symbolic of a poor experiment or a poor bit of academic work. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Yeah. Well, then that would know. be. Linguistic, right? right, right. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and and maybe just finally his point about um, saying that academic English is nobody's first language. Mm. Sure, but again, you know, English, somebody with an English L one is, I think, still clearly going to have an advantage there. Right. He does. He does summarize quite a lot of research showing the the struggles that people have with learning to write papers mm-hmm. in their first language as well. Okay, yeah, so there is, yeah. there's quite a lot of evidence for that, but I, I tend to agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's saying there, there, there isn't enough research, um, and then he says it's a myth. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the response was written by Pulitzer Alice et al. I'm not going to say all the names because I can't pronounce all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but this response is called, Is Linguistic Injustice a Myth? A response to Highland. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this response focuses on the idea of linguistic privilege. Um, mm-hmm. It argues that L1 writers have more linguistic privilege overall than L2 writers, mm-hmm. making it easier for them to access important academic institutions and publishing forums. So that doesn't mean all L1 writers have that. Is it, so they, they make the comparison yeah. to white privilege and male privilege. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean all white people and all male people benefit in the same way, but only in general you are more you, mm-hmm. you, know, yeah, yeah. you have some obstacles removed from mm-hmm. you. Okay. Um, so they, they talk about linguistic privilege a lot, um, and they make a couple of points. But Sorry, linguistic yeah. privilege in terms of access to academic institutions and publishing forums? Uh, in terms of... In ways? In, well, in terms of... Um, your your first language and your ability to kind of to what well, to write in that language, I guess, okay. um, in in a way that is seen as more grammatical or whatever, I guess, uh-huh. um, makes it easier for you to write papers that will be submitted by these forums. And maybe uh, people who are running these forums are more tilted towards you as uh, a. Okay, so when you say ac- access those institutions, it means mm. be accepted by them. Yes. I see. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so the first point uh, is that publishing may require less effort for, they say, native speakers. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> um, so they say it takes more effort to produce less output for someone working in their second language. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, they, don't, they don't back that up. That's kind of an assertion, but it's, that's what they say. Um, they say that while Highland shows that writing is difficult for L1 learners... That doesn't entail that it's not even more difficult for L- sorry L one writers. That doesn't entail that it's not even more difficult for L two writers. Sure. Um, they say that many factors influence academic publishing, as Highland writes, mm-hmm. um, but this doesn't mean that language is not one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they say that while they agree that the native non native distinction is a problem, that there are other factors. They say that even uh, sig- that significant differences can still exist even between very generalized groups. So they say, for, they give an example with uh, if a scientist says uh, men are taller than women, 
um, someone could come in and say, well, but women are taller than, and it, you know, so women are taller than each other and men are taller than each other and some women are taller than some men and all this kind of thing, but it wouldn't make a difference between the general statements. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The second point is the native-like English bias. Um, so they question Highland's assertion that because papers by L2 writers are published, this doesn't mean, this means that a bias doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and they say that a few counterexamples don't serve to contradict a trend. Mm-hmm. So Highland says, these papers are published, therefore th- there isn't a problem. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, yes, those papers are published, but you know, that's the same, they say. It's the same as saying America doesn't have a race problem because it had a black president. You know? mm-hmm. um, they also uh, question his claim that publication is not biased because editors and reviewers claim to make decisions based on content and not on language. So they argue that editors may base their decisions on unconscious biases rather than on their claimed reasons. Okay. So even though they say we're rejecting this on content, and even though they may believe that they're rejecting it on content, it could be that unconsciously they're rejecting it for a linguistic reason. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, no any evidence to back that? Okay. So they point to known unconscious biases, which have been researched, such as gender and racial biases. Yep. Um, and they actually suggest some ideas for empirical experiments that could be used to mm-hmm. test mm-hmm. this idea. Right. Okay. Um, and they conclude by saying that Highland is right to call for a more holistic view of the challenges facing academic writers, but his dismissal of linguistic injustice is premature and needs to be investigated more thoroughly. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the final article is a, a very short response by Highland uh-huh. um, called Language Myths and Publishing Mysteries, a mm-hmm. response to Paulus Hiles et al. Yep. Um, so in this short response, Highland argues that the authors are simply repeating the arguments he's already addressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and picks them up on using the word may when making claims. Mm -hmm. So they say publishing may require less effort for native English speakers, and publishing may be biased in favour of native like English. Mm -hmm. Um, He says, sure, there may be a prejudice, but also there may not, and we won't know until we have the evidence. Um, In fact, he says, as a result, their paper fails to take the debate forward, and ultimately, after some 4,000 words, end up more or less in the same position as me, with a call for more research. (laughs) Right. Um, he also says it's incumbent on those who make claims of linguistic disadvantage to substantiate them with hard evidence, mm-hmm. not for the debunkers to find counter evidence. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, that's that's his his basic point. Mm-hmm. Um, now I think that 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 both groups are right in a way, mm-hmm. uh, because I think that uh, Highland's right in saying there isn't enough evidence, mm-hmm. and I think this group is is right in saying there's not enough evidence. I see. I think the the main issue is the way the debate was phrased, perhaps, because mm-hmm. Highland called his, per- his first paper academic publishing and the myth of linguistic injustice. Right. So he makes a strong claim. Mm-hmm. And then in his final paper, his, his second response, he seems to be saying, well, it's, it's not necessarily a myth, but we, don't know until, we won't know until we've got the research. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it's an interesting article. I've, I've just summar- well, an interesting <clears throat> debate. I've mm-hmm. just summarised the articles quite quickly. Um, but if you are interested, I believe that the Journal of Second Language Writing is all open access, so mm. you can find these articles without having to do tedious um, sci-hub logins. <laughs> um, so please go and read them. They're, very, they're all very well written as well, I should say. Um, so that's uh, today's TEFL News, the debate in the Journal of Second Language Writing. TEFL Pioneers. Okay, for today's TEFL Pioneer... Um, we're going to talk about a man called Robert Loth. Mm. That's not a uh, current Tefalologist and mm. future Tefal pioneer Robert Loth. <laughs> this is Robert Loth. I think it's actually pronounced Louth. Yeah. Louth. Right. Okay. Right. Louth. Yeah. Uh, so he was born 27th of November 1710, and he died 3rd of November 1787. Okay. Um, I guess he, he was mainly known as a, as a bishop. He was a bishop of the Church of England. But he was also a, uh, a biblical scholar, and a, not, not only a biblical scholar, a, a poetry scholar. Um, he was uh, at New College, Oxford, um, actually where he uh, did his BA and Master's, um, but he also became a professor. Mm. Um, however, um, obviously what we're going to talk about today is his work uh, connected with language. Yeah. And he is um, well known in linguistic circles for writing what's considered not the first, but one of the very first um, English grammars. Okay. So grammar in the sense of a book right. describing right. the grammar of a language. Mm. Yeah. 
So in 1762, he published a book called A Short Introduction to English Grammar. Mm -hmm. um, and it describes the English language, it describes the rules for putting the various words and sounds together. Mm -hmm. He starts right at the beginning. He starts with the alphabet and sounds and letters and then words, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the first English grammar, this is, not the first grammar. Yeah, yeah, the first oh. English grammar. Okay, good, yeah. good. And again, apparently there, there were a couple before, but um, this is the one that, first of all, became very popular, um, and it's kind of considered the one that inspired lots of the ones that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. It maybe fell out of favor, especially recently, um, because it's, it's also considered the, the kind of start of prescriptivist grammar, or right. a prescriptivist view of, mm. of language. Um, so he, he, you know, he, he talks about all these rules of the language. Um, he talks about the problems with double negatives. Mm. Um, about, uh, he, he very famously also talked about um, preposition stranding. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to quote here. He said, this is an idiom which our language is strongly inclined to. It prevails in common conversation, suits very well with the familiar style in writing, but the placing of the preposition before the relative is more graceful, as well as more perspicuous and agrees much better with the solemn and elevated style. Mm. So he's not only um, describing what he thinks should be done in terms of um, language, but also kind of commenting on it, making value judgments on right, it. Right, right. Um, the, some of the, the, the stuff I read about it um, accuses him of inspiring even uh, the Eat, Shoots, and Leaves book. Ah, uh, right. Which, yeah. <laughs> I don't like that book. No. Which the, the best review of that book I read um, just spent the entire review picking out all the times she goes against <laughs> her own rules, which which people have done about Louth as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he it, he was he's basically been accused now of of being a prescriptivist, um, talking about these all these rules that now we know don't need to be followed, mm -hmm. splitting infinitives, etc. Um, and people have gone back and looked at his writing. He, he he wrote a lot of letters. Um, to various family members and friends, and they, they've gone back and looked at them and noticed he, he you know, often breaks his own rules. Mm. Um, so his name was kind of dragged through the mud, basically, as a, as a prescriptivist. Yeah. Um, however, uh, there has been some kind of reversal of, of this view of, of Lauf um, recently. Um, there's a scholar, her name is Ingrid Tikenboon van Ostad, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Um, and she, she wrote a book about um, Lauf called The Bishop's Grammar. And she, she also actually runs a blog, which is still going, about Lauf. Um, and she takes a slightly different view of Lauf. Um, so first of all, she's one of these people who went back and looked at all of his writing and compared the way he writes to the rules that he put down in his grammar. Mm. And there's a few things she noticed. She noticed that he often does break his own rules, um, mm. but she noticed that it depends very much on who she's, who he was writing to. Right. To whom he was writing. No. <laughs> who he was writing to. Um, so you mean she, she looked at his, his own words mm -hmm. and applied his rules to yeah. his, his writing? Yeah. Okay. Mm. And found that in, in cases, basically when he was writing to his wife or to his children, he didn't follow these rules. Mm -hmm. Right. And when he was writing to, you know, hoity-toity posh people in society, mm -hmm. he would follow these rules. Mm. Um, she, she also points out that the, he, he gives lots of examples in his book of, of mis, you know, people not following the rules and correcting it. Mm. And these, these examples tend to come from literature or you know, published letters. Mm. Um, but she points out that maybe the, the line between a prescriptivist and a descriptivist is not so clear. Mm. Um, because he, he also points out that, I mean, I think she bases on the fact that he doesn't follow these rules, that he's not prescribing these rules mm. that, he, that he puts down. Mm. Right. These are rules that he's gathered from things he's read. So right. in a way, you could, you could say that is descriptivist. Mm. I guess, but then if he was making value judgments about them as well, mm. then that is more prescriptivist. That's right? true. As a religious man, he should be preaching what he teaches. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, he was. So somebody uh, wrote a, a, a paper um, a while ago, mm -hmm. um, earlier last century, called um, Bishop Louth Was a Fool. And this, this is what, one of the big attacks on him as a prescriptivist. Mm -hmm. um, but Ingrid... Um, she wrote a, a paper not too long ago called Bishop Louth Was Not a Fool. Mm. 
<laughs> this is <laughs> scintillating back and forth. <laughs> That's right. So what she found out, or what, what, she, what she puts forward, is that uh, he wrote this book, actually, never intending it to be published. Mm. He wrote this book um, for his son, Thomas, right. um, when his son was, was very young. And basically the idea was, um, this was kind of a, a guide that he wrote for his son. Um, and it was, there, there, there's a lot of class issues here. So what, one of the issues that seems to be connected with Louth is social mobility. Right. And that maybe he was interested in rising above his station in terms of, of society mm. and class. And what seems to be her thesis is that he wrote this book for his son to kind of help him move in these kind of more upper-class circles. Mm. And that plays out in her analysis of his writing, where he, when he's writing to friends or family members, he doesn't follow these rules. And when he's writing to, to you know, upper-class people, he does. But does, mm. he, does he mention that mobility and grammar himself? Is he aware of his... his That's his, a good uh, question, yeah, I'm not his sure. Le- his lexical choice. Yeah, and, <laughs> possibly. I mean, she even... She's a big Louth apologist, basically. Right. Um, and she even says, like, that example of the, the preposition at the end is, his, is him being funny. Right. It's an okay. intentional joke, which, mm. who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, it is quite funny. <laughs> it is quite funny. Um, but, yeah, so basically he wrote it for his son, um, and that was all he thought of it. But then one of his flock, what do you, <laughs> one of his people, yeah. <laughs> who he's bishoping over, yeah. Um, whose wife had recently given birth, wanted a copy for his own son. And so he, so he went to, a, he went to a, a printer and said, oh, can you print off one of these? A guy called Robert Dodsley. And Dodsley realized the value of this and then printed off a load and started selling them. Right. Um, and then up, updates were made to the book. This, this seems like an issue with a lot of older books. Like they, they were either not written for the purpose they were eventually used, or they weren't written for publication at all, mm-hmm. or they were gathered together into something. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people always talk about the, the Bible as one book, but of course it was yeah. lots of different books, right, which right, then right. all got stuck mm-hmm. together. And, yep. Yeah, and actually, um, so I've, I've been reading about other, other possible future Tefl pioneers, uh-huh. um, and they have the same thing, like things being published as, uh, as a book that was actually just a series of letters between people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Hmm. So apparently, Louth, like he, he was uh, keen to get professional linguists involved in this, but it seems like maybe they, it, it never happened. Um, but when it was published, he had this, this kind of dual, in his mind, there was a dual purpose for this book, um, which was that it could be for linguists who were involved in describing the language, but then it could also be for the general public who were keen to basically sound posher than they were. Mm. Do you think his son ever read this book? He was probably the last to read it. <laughs> seems, seems like. Couldn't afford a copy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I bet he did read it. Yeah, and he thought, my dad's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he had seven children, so uh, hopefully at least one of them read it. Did they all get a separate book? <laughs> their own book? <laughs> you can have the language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Plants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Medicine, you're the favoured child. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so uh, apparently the book, that a lot of the examples he has include the name of his son, Thomas. Things like, I love Thomas. Mm. Thomas is loved by me. <laughs> <laughs> he actually put that in a, in a book that he mm. gave to Thomas. Oh, that's yeah. nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, th- I think maybe one issue to think about is, is this th- the difference between descriptivist and prescriptivist grammar? And is, is it such a... Is there such a wide gap between the two? Mm. What yeah. do you think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I like this idea that um, things are changeable depending mm-hmm. on the audience. And so to say one is... Yeah, to say one is wrong and one approach is, is the one to use doesn't really kind of answer that. Mm. In the words. Mm. I mean, but he was, he was addressing the, this issue of register of, of, you know, it depends who you're... Yeah, yeah. Who you're yeah. talking to. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think register is something that's becoming a bit more... Flu- at least in English, I think it's something that's becoming a bit more fluid. Mm-hmm. Like, you mm-hmm. know, the, it used to be that register on TV was mm-hmm. very fixed. You had your BBC English, but now you've got, you know, the, the guy who does Big Brother and all that. You know, pe- people with all different kinds of regional accents are showing up on TV. Um, 
and like modes of like uh, like for example in academic writing it used to be that the authorial voice the the, the authorial I mm. was banished from it and you had to say you know the author or talk about it in the third person but now you can say I and that's fine mm-hmm. um, and so mm. yeah I, I think generally maybe I don't I don't know if you could say that register is becoming less important or if it's just changing or you know or if it's if it's a fake change <laughs> that, that's disguising a deeper level of register I don't know mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd just like to maybe finish or, or just set up a last bit of discussion with the beginning of um, Louth's preface to, to his book, mm. which mm. I'll read here. So he says, The English language hath been much cultivated during the last 200 years. Mm-hmm. It hath been considerably polished and refined. Its bounds have been greatly enlarged. Its energy, variety, richness, and elegance have been abundantly proved by numberless trials in verse and in prose upon all subjects and in every kind of style. But... Whatever other improvements it may have received, uh, it hath made no advances in grammatical accuracy. I guess what he was saying was that it hadn't been formalised in the way that Latin or Greek or whatever had been, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because those languages were taught very much through, mm-hmm. um, through an examination of, the, of the, the grammars that had been written by people like Dionysius Thrax, who we talked about before, and Donatus, mm-hmm. and yeah. so on. But yeah, so so they had the, they had those written down. But English was like modern English had only just sort of begun at this time, I guess. Yep. So they didn't have a standardized grammar or a standardized spelling. Um, or did they at this point have standardized? It's pretty. It's fairly standardized. Mm. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. They just, but keep, it's. I mean, it's. He keeps trying subjects instead of subjects. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Is, so is that the kind of thing he's talking about? I think so. Yeah. Mm. So he, he, I mean, he is in terms of as a pioneer. I think he certainly qualifies because what his his grammar is considered basically one of the first. And most comprehensive, you know, books, things written down, which really do describe the English language in such detail. Mm. And as you say, um, Latin and Greek had been been subject to that before. Mm. And he does you know, he does do the thing where he, you know he kind of uses Latin as the model, um, but he's maybe less rigid about that than than people after him, for mm. example. So that was uh, today's TEFL pioneer, Robert Lauf. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Don't forget, if you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send us an email at teflology at gmail.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter at teflology. Visit our website, uh, wwwtephology podcastcom That's where you can find all our previous episodes. And don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes as well. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>